tracking the amazing growth of the first century church to challenge and inspire the 21st century church. This is Unstoppable Church, Then and Now, recorded on location in Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, Greece, Malta and Italy. Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont is in conversation for the next 30 minutes with David Taverner. We're still amongst the ruins of ancient Philippi, Mike, and last time we were hearing the story of Lydia and her conversion. Is there more to come in Philippi? Oh, absolutely, David. And this whole section of Acts is one of my favourites. And the bit that we're about to look at today um, is definitely the high point of, of one of my favourites. We've moved just a little bit further along into the ruins of the ancient city, um, destroyed by earthquake. There have been lots of earthquakes in this region over the centuries. It's where two major tectonic plates meet. And so earthquakes were very common. But there's still a lot left standing here to show us what would have been here. And uh, we are sitting right alongside again that Via Ignatia that we talked about last time, the main road that ran from Rome to its provinces in the east. And we're at that point where the Via Ignatia runs right alongside the Roman Forum, the huge open paved area behind us. And the Forum was the sort of uh, public centre of life. It's where all the public buildings were. Um, it, it's where a lot of the administration happened, where some of the buying and selling happened. Um, it, it was the equivalent of our sort of city centre these days. It's even where the public toilets were in those days as well. The Romans were very particular about their hygiene. And that's behind us, and looking in front of us, well, we've got the ruins of a, a basilica from a, a later Christian period. But towering behind that is this rock outcrop, the Acropolis of the city, which would have been walled at one time at the top, and the fortress into which the city and its citizens would have retreated in times of attack. So an amazing location. But we've come further down the street because we're right next to a cave that is traditionally the site of the place where Paul is going to end up in the story that we're looking at today. Well, let's pick up the story then in uh, Luke's account. Let's get straight into it. We're in Acts chapter 16 and we're going to pick up the story of what happened in Philippi from verse 16. One day when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now she kept this up for many days. And finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned round and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace, the forum behind us here, to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. Well, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Well, a bit of an understatement, but that's not good news for Paul and his uh, <laughs> friends. Well, it's, yeah, another of these troubles that he seems to find himself in one way or another, uh, isn't it? And, I mean, frankly, uh, so unfair one might feel as well, because all he was doing here was, frankly, doing a good turn for this girl and, and ends up getting thrown into jail for it. And he is stirring up trouble, though, because, you know, her owners, as it puts it, uh, are clearly not very happy. 
No, not at all. So he's obviously based here in the city. We've seen he was based at the house of Lydia. We saw in a previous episode. And uh, he obviously leaves here one day to walk through the city and to go to that place of prayer where he first encountered Lydia to continue to share the good news of Jesus with the Jews who were gathering there. And on his way, um, he is met by this slave girl. Uh, We read that she had a spirit by which she predicted the future and earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. So here is a girl, I mean, in our language today, here is a girl in slavery, literally, she is a slave girl, but um, really being abused and misused, like happens in slavery so often today. And uh, she's being used by her owners because somehow or other in her life, she has become possessed by uh, a particular evil spirit. Uh, It's described here as a spirit by which she predicted the future. But the Greek actually says there that uh, she was possessed by a python spirit, is the literal translating. Now, a python... Um, obviously a snake, but the python was a sort of mystical snake that was worshipped at Delphi, which is up there in the hills down in the Peloponnese area uh, of Greece, and associated with uh, the oracle at Delphi. And this sort of python spirit was reputed to come on people and to come on priests um, and to bring sort of prophetic words as they were possessed by this spirit. So somehow or other, this girl has become possessed of this dreadful, evil spirit that causes her to prophesy. Now, here's the interesting thing. She's prophesying accurately. (laughs) She's prophesying that these are indeed servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And, you know, you might have thought, well, Paul should have been very grateful for that, shouldn't he? Thank you, telling people you know, who would no doubt have seen this girl walking around the marketplace here behind us, the forum, uh, and speaking and prophesying. And here she is saying, listen to these guys. But no, Paul wants nothing of it. Why? Because it's demonic. And, you know, and what do demons and Christ uh, have in partnership, have in common, Paul puts it in uh, his first letter to the Corinthians. So he really wants nothing of this. And clearly... Uh, the text tells us that she kept this up for many days to the point where Paul can't ignore it anymore. I mean, it, it, it is really irritating him to begin with. Uh, and then he seems to get really angry about this uh, and really troubled, not just angry, but troubled, the word says. And so he turns around and says to this evil spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that minute, the spirit left. Wow, praise God, how exciting. Here is the Lord Jesus showing that he is higher than any demon, any principality, any power, any God. And this girl is who has been enslaved for so long, held in this slavery, both literal and spiritual, being freed. And you would think that absolutely everybody was happy. But of course, while this was good news for the girl, it was bad news for her owner because they made a lot of money out of this. You know, they were trafficking her. They were using her so that, uh, you know, people would come up and say, you know, can you give me a a prophetic word uh, about this, that or the other? And of course, they would pay the owners for that. So suddenly, uh, economics is affected by the gospel. Oh, my goodness, that is a no-go area, isn't it? Even in the world today. Mm. Keep your Christianity in a nice private little place, but keep it out of business, keep it out of economics, keep it out of politics. And, of course, you can't do it in any of those. So, yeah, when they see what has happened and their source of money-making has gone, They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into this marketplace behind us to face the authorities. Because remember I said the forum was a mixture of marketplace, public buildings, and where the authorities would be. And they bring them before the magistrates. 
and said these men are Jews and are throwing our city into uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Us Romans, do you remember? I've said in a previous episode that Philippi was a colony, a colonia, a little mini Rome. It had certain privileges as a colony. People dressed as Romans, spoke as Romans, saw itself as Rome. And, and so they're sort of, you can imagine them puffing their chest up, can't you? Mm. Uh, you know, we Romans, we Romans don't stand for this. Now, what do they mean by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept? Well, Rome had hundreds and hundreds of religions. Why not just accept Christianity as another of them? Well, quite simply, it wasn't authorised. Uh, Romans had what they called uh, a religio licta, authorised religion. And Judaism was one of those. Obviously, there were all the Roman and Greek gods and the religions that followed them. Um, and this weird Judaism thing, as far as the Romans were concerned, was deemed a religio licta. And initially, Romans just saw Christianity as a sort of branch of Judaism. So, you know, it, it didn't really matter. It too was a religio licta. But these people are saying, no, it isn't. It's, you know, it, it's not one of our authorised religions. And they've come to our city here causing trouble, stirring trouble by preaching an unauthorised religion. And before we know it, the crowd has joined in the attack against poor Paul and Silas. The magistrates order them to be stripped and beaten. No trial yet, you know. No, what do you have to say about that? And they are flogged, they're beaten, and they are taken into the city jail right here behind where we are sitting. So mob rule, yet again. Oh, absolutely. And we keep coming across this, don't we, David, in the story of the Book of Acts. There are so many times when uh, the mob rules and when uh, a crowd suddenly turns against the early Christian preachers and, and a riot happens. And that's what happens still today, isn't it? Very often, you know, let's face it, you know, if there's a fight in a city centre uh, turning out time on a Saturday night, it can quickly grow and develop as people join in without really knowing what they're joining in with and then ask later and certainly that's the same thing that had happened here. Somewhat ironic that the slave girl was freed <laughs> and Paul ends up in prison. It is, isn't it? It is, it really is ironic but the reason this is one of my favourite stories in the book of Acts is because Paul at this point you know, doesn't turn around and say, well, thank you very much, God. That's what you get for trying to do God's work, isn't it? Just look at the mess we're in now. Um, he doesn't take that attitude at all. And what goes on to happen in this place so close to where we are, in the heart of Philippi, is an amazing example to us of how to stay focused, which is the title of this episode, how to stay focused when things go wrong. Well, I was going to say, you know, my thought would be, how are you going to get out of this one? Well, why don't we read the story and find out? Acts 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer caught for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God he and his whole family. 
Now, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. And the jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we're Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? Ha! No! Let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. So they came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. And after Paul and Silas came out of prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. And then they left. There's that phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But it uh, didn't quite work out like that here. No, and it's interesting, Paul never saw himself as tough. He saw him, his God as tough. He saw the Lord Jesus as tough. And so rather than sort of, you know, dig down deep and think, OK, let's make a plan for how we're going to get out of here, how we're going to handle this, I love their response. And this is why... This chapter is one of my favourites in this book. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Oh, my goodness, what a challenge that is to us today. I mean, you know, things couldn't have gone more wrong, really, could they? They were preaching Jesus, did a miracle, set this girl free, and what happens? They end up getting jumped on by a mob, beaten up, dragged before the magistrates, thrown into jail unfairly it would have been so easy to say god it's not fair but they don't they stay focused that theme of this episode they stay focused on god and what are they doing they're praying and singing hymns to god now i think it's really important that we know what they were doing and what they weren't doing they weren't praising god for their circumstances they were praising God in their circumstances. They weren't saying, dear God, thank you that I've just been beaten up and thrown into jail. They were praising God and saying, thank you, God, that you're still Lord, you're still King, you still rule over everything. You've still got your hand on this situation. You have not abandoned us. You're on your throne, Jesus. I imagine those sort of prayers and those sort of songs. And it's fascinating that as they're focusing on God, and did you know, by the way, all the other prisoners listening, so they're not doing this quietly, they're doing it out loud. In other words, they're resolved that their evangelism is going to continue wherever they might be. And it's while they are doing this that suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Now, we've said previously that this area is uh, well known for its earthquakes they've happened throughout history here because of the two tectonic plates rubbing against one another so you could say it was a coincidence oh you could say it was a coincidence or you could say it was a god incidence which is the word i much prefer so god uses something very natural earthquakes happened around here but oh my goodness what timing this earthquake just happens to happen at the very moment when they're in the jail and praising God and their hearts are declaring how great he is and when Paul and Silas need God to do something and God provides an answer. You see, as they stay focused on God and not on their circumstances, God is then able to release his hand and able to release his power to act. This earthquake comes their chains fall off, the doors fling open, and they could have fled. And the jailer, of course, is terrified that they had. Now, why is he terrified? Well, because if a jailer lost his prisoners, he gave his life instead. So here's the power of God demonstrated because Paul and Silas stayed focused in the most disconcerting and unpleasant of circumstances. And just looking around at how many rocks have <laughs> fallen uh, over the many years that they've been here, uh, the thought of an earthquake, you know, would have meant that uh, 
everybody would have panicked uh, at that moment. Everybody would have known about it. Everybody would have known, obviously, about the uh, effect on the prison. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, earthquakes were common. Everybody knew what to do. Uh, it was interesting in our hotel the other day, I noticed in the lift, it had a sign that I've seen all around the world, do not use the lift in case of fire. But it had an extra word or two. It said, do not use the lift in case of fire or earthquake. Because this whole region um, is susceptible to earthquakes. People know about them. People know what to do. And when that earthquake came on that particular day, um, they knew what it was and clearly would have run out of their buildings, run for their lives. And the most natural thing for Paul and the prisoners to have done, particularly if the chains have fallen off their hands, is, is to run. I mean, who's ever heard of prisoners just sitting there and waiting? Now, I mean, human instinct takes over when an earthquake happens. You run to get out of a building into the open air. And yet the Spirit of God somehow restrains them. Their chains might have fallen off, but they're still restrained. And it's like the Holy Spirit's using this to say, wait, wait. And when they call out to the jailer and say, we're still here, I don't think he can believe it. And it's interesting. He simply then says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, where's that come from? They, you know, they've not preached the gospel to him. They've not talked about Jesus. No doubt he knew why they were in there. Maybe he'd heard them in the marketplace for all I know. But it's interesting that this jailer had had a, a power encounter, a God encounter. Now, he didn't know what it was. He didn't understand it. But he knew he had touched something of the other, of the beyond, of that which he could not describe himself. And so all he can cry out is, what do I have to do to be saved? And then it's at that point that Paul starts to preach the gospel to him. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. In other words, they now start to use this and the guard's openness to what has happened to begin to speak to him about the Lord Jesus. You know, there's a great model there in how open are we to taking opportunities to speaking to people when they cry out or when they're in need in, in their situation or their circumstance. Do we, do we hold back uh, or, or do we take the opportunity to, in an appropriate way, you know, whatever is needed, but to explain something about Jesus and God's love? in that moment of need, like Paul and Silas did here. And in practical terms, you know, the jail had gone, so the jailer was out of a job. <laughs> he certainly was, or at least until they rebuilt it. The interesting thing was, this was a job almost certainly in his retirement, because um, jailers in Roman times were usually um, retired uh, Roman soldiers, often like the equivalent of our sergeant majors, maybe, uh, in the world today. And uh, they were often given jobs as jailers, as sort of a little perk, a little side job in their retirement to boost their pension. So until they built the jail, he would certainly have been out of a job. But it's almost like he, he doesn't mind. Because he's sort of about to start a new life, in a sense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. He is going to become part of the Church of Jesus here. It's interesting when... The city officials come the next day and, you know, say what's happened. And then it, also interesting that clearly Paul and Silas are still there. They've not done a bunk. They've not gone off to Lydia's house. They're still there. And they go through this thing of we won't be released quietly. You arrested us publicly. Release us publicly now. We're Roman citizens. We know our rights here. And so they are released formally. And what do they do then? They go back to Lydia's house, the base for the church that we've looked at in a previous episode, where they met with the brothers and encouraged them. Now, here's the thing that I find fascinating and exciting out of this story. We don't know a lot about the people who made up the church, but what we do know is at least two families that met there. There was Lydia and her household, and there was this jailer, and his household. Two very different types. Oh, unbelievably different. Lydia, we've said, a wealthy businesswoman 
uh, dealing in high-end fashion, purple goods. She came from Thyatira, a place that was famous for producing purple dye, and that's where she'd either was based or came from, either she'd relocated here or maybe this was a second home here, um, whichever it was. But here is a very, very wealthy businesswoman. The other family is the family of the jailer, because Paul had said, believe you and your household, and if you and your household believe, you will be saved. So this is the other end of the spectrum, because as a retired Roman soldier after decades of serving in the Roman army, I mean, this wouldn't have been a sort of genteel, uh, polite guy. You know, he, he would have been rough and ready as a soldier. He'd seen a few things in his life. So you've got these two complete opposite ends of the social spectrum. And it's almost like God's sense of humor here. Uh, and he says, there you go, then let's put you lot together. And this is the glory of the Christian church. When we come to Jesus, we don't just come to him, we come to one another. And he is able to take the old barriers that divided us and kept us apart and to pull those down and bring us together in order to demonstrate to the world around this is what life can look like when you let King Jesus rule. This is how people can live together, no matter what they have been in the past, no matter what their social strata, no matter what their experiences of life. And one of my greatest joys today is when you see a church that has people of different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different ages. And although they might all have their own personal interests, they can come together in Jesus and know that they are brothers and sisters in Christ and love one another and serve with one another and rejoice in one another. And so this was a, an incredible mix for the first church here in Philippi. God's sense of humor, yeah but also God's demonstration of what his kingdom looks like when people will really yield their lives to Jesus and be filled with his Holy Spirit. So no doubt this community of new believers grew, uh, they were added to, and at some point in the future then, Paul was to write a letter back to this church. Absolutely, and it's a letter that's very well known by many Christians and very well loved. It is Paul's most joyful letter, the letter to the Philippians. And it was written about 10 years after this incident that we've looked today, while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, that's referred to at the very end of the book of Acts. So he's in prison again, ironically. Yeah, in prison or probably more technically under house arrest at that point because he's in a private rented house, but, but guarded by soldiers. And while he's there, he takes the opportunity to... Uh, to keep on spreading the gospel and to keep being a pastor and to keep sending letters to his friends in these churches. And one of them is to this church here, the most joyful of his letters. In fact, I remember when I went to my very first church after I graduated from seminary from Bible college, one of the very first series of sermons I preached was from Philippians. And I can remember even now what I called it, the joy of Jesus. Hmm. And that's what the whole letter is about. It's Paul's joy in hearing that they are still going on well with Jesus. He thanks them for their partnership in the gospel. And he says, I don't want you feeling sorry for me, you know, locked up here, because actually my being locked up here in this house arrest has opened up huge opportunities for the gospel. And he wants them to know that although he expects to be released soon. He urges them that whatever happens, just keep standing firm in Jesus. You know, keep your joy, keep your peace, and uh, act like Jesus. And in chapter two, many Christians will know that well-known hymn of, of chapter two. It may have been written by Paul, it may have been written by someone else, and Paul used it, but that beautiful hymn about have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, making himself nothing, and taking the form of a servant, humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he says to them, that's the sort of attitude I want you to have. It's the sort of attitude he still wants us to have today, one of taking the lowest place, taking the humble place, because if we do, God is well able to lift us up. In his third chapter, he he has to warn them about the Judaizers, those who kept dogging his footsteps, saying, um, you need to be circumcised and, and keep the law to be real Christians. And he has to warn them uh, against that and encourages them to be mature. Great passage about forgetting what lies behind. I press on to the goal of the upward prize in Christ Jesus. He's using an image there from the games, from running. You know, a runner doesn't keep looking over his shoulder to see where he is. He focuses on the finishing line and keeps going. And that's what I want you to keep doing, he says to them. And chapter four then ends with some lovely exhortations and greetings and thanks to them for the gift that they've sent. So a really personal letter full of joy, full of encouragement from a guy who once again is all locked up, just like he was locked up here, but a guy who refused to be constrained by his circumstances and who stayed focused on Jesus, whatever happened. And I just want to say to our listeners today, maybe something has gone wrong in your life at the moment. Maybe something has not turned out as you would have liked it to do. Maybe you feel locked up, as it were. Well, keep focused. Keep your eyes on this Jesus that Paul wrote about from Rome. Keep your eyes on him and wait for the earthquake that God will send to free you to continue your purposes and your part in Unstoppable Church. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner travelling from Jerusalem to Rome and beyond to track the amazing growth of the first century church and what that means for the Unstoppable Church of the 21st century. There are more Bible podcasts from Mike and David on the UCB Player app and major podcast platforms. Check out Jesus Then and Now or Bible Books in 30 Minutes.